Hello, hello, and welcome to California Death Row, where we're talking about it. There are currently 727 condemned inmates on California's death row. Today, we're going to talk about the case that led to California's three strikes law and the support for the law, and it's the kidnapping and murder of Polly Kloss, which was on national news at the time and received lots of attention and the FBI got involved. So Richard Allen Davis was 40 years old at the time of the offense, which was October 1st, 1993. And he was received on California's death row in San Quentin on September 26, 1996. He had a long criminal history that included convictions for assault, battery, kidnapping, and robbery. He was paroled on June 27, 1993. In early July of 1993, Richard gained admission into the Turning Point Shelter in San Mateo, which is a transitional housing facility for the homeless. While at Turning Point, Richard initially worked at a precision sheet metal company and later as a painter. On the weekend of August 21st through the 23rd of 1993, Richard took a bus to visit his sister and brother-in-law, Darlene and Richard Schwann, who lived on the Coyote Valley Indian Reservation. The bus stopped at a depot in Petaluma near Walnut Park in Wickersham Worker, Wor Park, which were frequent, frequented by transients and drug users. The same weekend, Richard bought Richard Schwann's 1979 Ford Pinto hatchback, after which he quit his job. So he used the car to make several trips to Ukiah, which is where his sister lived, to visit the Schwans from September through November of 1993. During this period, Richard took an employee, told, sorry, he didn't take, he told an employee at Turning Point that he had gone to Petaluma to look for his mother and on two different occasions, he told one of his employers that he was visiting family in Petaluma. At least four witnesses saw Richard lo loitering around Walnut Park and Workersham Park in Petaluma in August and September of 1993. Richard stood out because of his disheveled appearance, his yellow headband, his heavily tattooed arms, his public drinking, and his peppered gray hair and beard. On at least one of those oca occasions, he was seen drinking and laughing in the park with his sister, Darlene. On either September 30th or October 1st of 1993, Richard entered the Seductions Adult Store in Ukiah and bought a blue Rough Rider condom that the owner, Jeanette Turner, was pretty sure was stubbed, studded, or ribbed. So Petaluma is a city in Sonoma County, but due to the media attention of this case, a change of venue was requested and granted because they believe that if it was tried in Sonoma County, the jurors would be prejudiced towards them and he would not get that impartial trial that you are you're guaranteed to receive from our constitution, our bill of rights for both from the state's constitution and also our actual national constitution and bill of rights. So it was tried in Santa Clara County, but remember Petaluma is in Sonoma County. So Eve Nickel lived with her two daughters, Polly Kloss, who was 12, and Annie, who was six. And they lived in a small three bedroom house in Petaluma near Walnut Park in Wickersham Park. On Friday, October 1st of 1993, Polly had a slumber party at her home with, with two classmates, Kate and Jillian. They were also both 12. Jillian arrived between 7 and 7.15. After a few minutes, she and Polly walked to a nearby convenience store, bought popsicles, and returned home. Their walk took them past Wickersham Park. Just before Kate arrived, 
Jillian and Polly went out to the front doorstep to wait for Kate. Between eight and nine, Kate arrived with her mother. As Kate's mother got back into her car, which was blocking the sidewalk, she saw a man walking straight at her vehicle as if he was going to crash into it, so she jerked her car forward. The man wore dark clothing. He had a rather bushy gray and brown hair, possibly swept back into a ponytail, and he was carrying something that looked like a bag. Kamika Milstead was 13, and she was a nearby resident and she saw Richard get to his car and head down the same sidewalk carrying a bag or a box. Meanwhile, the three girls played in Polly's bedroom. As Halloween was a few weeks away, Kate, who was dressed as a hippie, and Jillian applied makeup to Polly's face to make her look dead. Polly later changed into a white cotton denim skirt and a pink blouse that was tied into a knot in the front and removed most of the makeup. Around 10 p.m., Eve told the girls not to stay up too late and to keep the noise down, as she and Annie were going to bed. Eve went to her bedroom, which is separated from Polly's bedroom by a bathroom and another bedroom. Eve read in the bed for a few minutes with Annie next to her, and she, had, she and then Annie fell asleep. From 10 to 10.30, the three girls played board games and video games. Around this time, nearby resident Talia Miller was returning from a movie with her uncle. As her uncle was about to drop her off, Talia saw Richard carrying a duffel bag and walking toward her house. Because Talia was leery of homeless people, she asked her uncle to wait until the scary looking Richard passed the car. As Richard passed, he looked into the car and slid his hand over his face as if to conceal it. Richard was wearing dark clothing. He had combed back, collar-length collar dark hair, and a gray patched beard. Around this time, Sean Bush, Aaron Thomas, and Thomas's girlfriend were watching a movie in Thomas's granny unit behind Polly's home. While Sean smoked a cigarette in Aaron's doorway, he could see Aaron's bathroom which was separately located on Eve's back porch. At about 10.30 p.m., Sean saw Richard walking calmly up the stairs to Aaron's bathroom. When Richard noticed Sean looking at him, he turned his head away and reached for the bathroom door. Sean described Richard as stocky with very thick and wiry hair that was styled straight back and lighter on top than on bottom. Unaware that anything unusual was occurring, Sean resumed watching the movie. Meanwhile, the girls decided to set up their sleeping bags. When Polly opened the bedroom door to retrieve the sleeping bags, she discovered Richard in the doorway holding a knife and a bag. Richard said, don't scream or I'll slit your throat, and pointed and promised not to hurt them if they did what he said. He told the girls to lie face down on the floor and not to look at him. Jillian and Kate initially thought Richard was a friend of Polly or her family who was engaged in a prank. Richard said, where is the valuables? He repeatedly told them not to be scared and he was only doing this for the money. Richard wondered aloud why there were so many people present and expressed surprise when Polly told them that her mother was in the house. Polly said there was money in her jewelry box and asked him not to hurt her, her mother and sister. Richard was calm at first, but he sounded more frantic as events unfolded. All three girls lay down in a row on Polly's bedroom floor, and Richard tied their hands using a silky cloth. Cords cut from Polly's Nintendo machine and a strap from Polly's leather purse. He also gagged them with a silky cloth. He removed the, the cases from pillows in the bedroom and placed them over the girls' heads. At this point, Jillian no longer believed it was a joke. Richard told the girls that he was going to take Polly to show him where the valuables were, that he would return Polly to Jillian and Kate, and that he would be gone after they counted to a thousand. Richard then took Polly out of the room, promising he would not touch her. At that point, Richard had been in the bedroom for about 10 minutes. 
After a few minutes counting, with no sign of Polly, Jillian and Kate freed themselves, went to Eve's bedroom, and told her what had happened. After they unsuccessfully searched for Polly around the house, Eve called 911 around 11 p.m. Eve did not find any personal property missing from the house, but a pair of red leggings was later discovered missing from, from a chest of drawers in the bedroom. Diane Jaff lived with her 12-year-old daughter on a 192-acre parcel in Sonoma County between Santa Rosa and Sonoma on a rural his, hillside past the end of Pythian Road. From its intersection with State Highway 12, Pythian Road proceeds northward. At its end is a series of steep, curving, and narrow private roads, one of which leads to Dana's home. No trespassing signs were posted on the private road leading to Dana's property. <coughs> Sorry. And her house was several hundred, hundred yards past the gate. At about 10.45 or 11 on October 1st, 1993, Dana arrived home from work and relieved her babysitter, Shannon Lynch. Around 11.15 or 11.20, Shannon began driving away from, da from Dana's residence, and while she was still behind the gate, she saw Richard's Ford Pinto wedged against an embankment and stuck in a ditch with Richard hunched over the rear bumper. As she drove up, Richard appeared surprised to see someone else on the darkened road. Shannon stopped her car and Richard approached. He had bad breath and body odor with, with leaves embedded in his hair as if he had been caught in the bush and he was wearing a dark colored long sleeve sweatshirt that was inside out. She asked what he was doing and he replied, I'm stuck, I need some rope. When Shannon called Richard illiterate for not obeying the private road signs, he placed his hands on her window, told her to get out of the car, and demanded, what's up the road? Shannon remained in her car and told him there were people up the road who would call the police. Then she drove off. Frightened and upset, Shannon quickly drove to the nearest payphone and at 11.24 p.m. called Dana, urging her to call the police about a scary guy on her hill. Concerned about being alone with her young daughter, Dana dressed and got into the car with her daughter. As they drove down their private road, they saw Richard's car, but saw no one on the road. Dana drove to a payphone and called the police at 11.46 p.m. Some 15 minutes later, Sonoma County Sheriff's deputies, Mike Rankin and Thomas Howard, arrived in separate cars and met Dana at the intersection of Pythian Road and Highway 12. Because the Sonoma County Sheriff's Department and the Petaluma Police Department used different radio frequencies, deputies Rankin and Howard were unaware of Polly's abduction. <coughs> Excuse me. So Sonoma County is the county police and then Petaluma is that Petaluma City Police. And even though they're technically the same county, they were on different frequencies. Usually they're on different frequencies, so they're not receiving one another's calls. And they would rather have city police attend to that city's callings instead of always bringing the sheriffs. But sometimes the sheriffs do get involved. But in this particular case, they were on different frequencies and they did not know about Polly missing or any, any of those reports coming in. So Dana led the officers back up the road where they found Richard leaning against his car, smoking a cigarette. Dana told Richard he was on posted private property. Richard acknowledged the signs, but claimed that he had tried to turn and had become stuck in a ditch. Leaves, twigs, and other debris were in his hair and clinging to his socks, and he was wearing a yellow and blue striped long sleeve button down shirt. Dana told, told him the officers would help him and she went home. Deputies Howard and Rankin spoke to Richard, who smelled of alcohol and appeared to be sweating profusely. Deputy Rankin patted Richard down and noticed that Richard's pants were wet, but his shirt was not. Richard asked the officers what they were doing there, and Rankin explained that the property owner wanted Richard removed for trespassing. 
Richard claimed he was passing through the area from Oakland on the way to see a relative in Redwood Valley and had pulled off the roadway to do some sightseeing. He said he had tried placing dirt and brush under his car's wheel to get traction. The deputy saw little indication of any dirt or other debris placed under the wheel. Deputy Rankin ran a check on Richard's license plate, but he transposed some of the numbers and did not notice that the car was not registered to Richard. Richard said he was not on parole and he had never been in prison, which from earlier, you know, is completely false. He's been on parole since June of 1980. Yeah, 1983. And then he had been in prison from the kidnapping charges, the battery and assault. So he just told a complete blatant lie. So although Richard smelled of alcohol, Deputy Howard did not think he was intoxicated based upon the deputy's observations of Richard's pupils, balance, and speech. So sometimes they do different field sobriety tests to tell if they're over, well, probable cause that they're over the legal limit. So in this case, from his pupils, balance, and speech, it was not determined that he was intoxicated. So during a consent search of Richard's Ford Pinto, the deputies found a paper bag on the floorboard with three or four unopened Bud Budweiser beer cans, as well as two bags containing clothes, some of which appeared torn. As the two deputies discussed ways to free Richard's car and made unsuccessful efforts to the effect, Richard became more relaxed. At one point, he opened a can of beer and began drinking it, but Deputy Rankin told him to pour out the beer. After borrowing a chain from property owner Dana, the two deputies pulled Richard's car off the embankment and out of the ditch. While Deputy Howard returned Dana's chain, Deputy Rankin escorted Richard as he drove down Pythian Road to Highway 12. When both deputies drove onto Highway 12 from Pythian Road, they saw Richard park near the intersection. At 12.46 a.m. on Saturday, October 2nd, 1993, the deputies cleared the incident with dispatch. Though Polly Kloss was abduction had attracted national attention, her face was pictured in magazines. It was even on People Magazine or People Weekly. And during the early stages of the investigation, as many as 75 agents from the FBI and 50 Petaluma police officers canvassed Polly's neighborhood for evidence regarding her disappearance. So this gained national attention. And usually when cases gain national attention like this, this is when you will see those change of venues from courts. So since Petaluma is in Sonoma County, there was a change of venue and then it went to Santa Clara County, which is a neighboring county from, from Sonoma. So for nearly two months, the investi investigation received thousands of leads and tips. Richard was not linked with Polly's disappearance until November 27, 1993, when property owner Dana discovered in a clearing a few feet from where Richard's card had been stuck on October 1st, a pair of child-sized red knitted tights that were knotted at the knee, an adult-sized dark sweatshirt turned inside out, and a knotted piece of white silky cloth shaped like a hood. The hood was triangle shaped with one knot at its broader end and two knots forming two loops at its apex end and a concave area in the middle that appeared to have makeup smears on it. The soil in the clearing was exposed as if someone had purposefully cleared the area of ground cover. That night, Dana called the sheriff's office, left a message, and called again the next morning. On November 28, 1993, Deputy Sheriff Mike McManus arrived at Dana's property to inspect the scene. He and Dana found an unrolled condom one to two feet away from the clothes, a torn Rough Rider condom wrapper, two pieces of strapping tape, a beer bottle, an empty plastic six pack holder, and a book of matches. Dana told Deputy McManus of the October 1st incident involving Richard on her hillside. Now, if you remember, 
there was a Rough Rider studded condom that was bought at an adult store either November 30th or October 1st of that same year. So because it was starting to rain, Deputy McManus was concerned about damage to trace evidence and he did not follow normal evidence collection protocol. So if you're in, if you're in court and an officer says he didn't follow proper protocol, it will get questioned whether the evidence could be used or not, and then it's up to the jury to decide if it could be used. After some motions that go on on admitting evidence, but ultimately it is up to the jury to decide whether the evidence actually could be used or not besides those other motions if it made it past those motions. So instead of leaving the scene intact, he picked up the items and placed them in a box. He left the unrolled condom because he did not have materials in his patrol vehicle to collect such evidence and he, and he believed it was a sealed container that would not be damaged by the rain. Later that day, an FBI team took photographs and recovered it. So Deputy McManus researched the October 1st, 1993 incident on Dana's hillside and determined Richard's identity and his prior criminal record of assault and kidnapping. He gave this information to the Petaluma Police Department. The Petaluma Police Department's lead investigator, Sergeant Michael Meese, examined the evidence collected by Deputy McManus with his department's lead evidence technician, Officer Larry Pelton, and they agreed that the hood-shaped white cloth matched cloth pieces found in Polly's bedroom. The next day, an FBI laboratory confirmed the match. So this linked the scene at Dana's to Polly's bedroom, and since this October 1st incident was with Richard, so now they linked Richard to Polly's disappearance. So the Petaluma Police Department learned that Richard was a parolee who had an outstanding parole violation warrant against him based on October 19th, 1993, drunk driving arrest in Mendocino County. Richard's parole, parole, off, parole officer told them that Richard was at his sister's home in Ukiah. So on November 30th, 1993, Petaluma, yeah, Petaluma police officers and FBI agents arrived at Richard's sister's residence in Ukiah and arrested him without incident on a parole violation warrant. So that's how they were able to arrest him. He already had a warrant out. So they seized Richard's car and personal belongings. And that was when Richard had shaved off his beard. So by the time they arrest him, arrested him, his beard was gone. Later that day, the officers transported Richard to the Mendocino County Sheriff's Department where Petaluma police officer Pelton and FBI agent Larry Taylor confronted him about Polly Kloss's kidnapping. Richard denied any involvement. Two days later, on December 2nd, 1993, criminalists matched Richard's palm print with the print found in Polly's bedroom. So since he had already had a prison record for these kidnappings and assaults, he was already, his fingerprints and his were already in the system so they didn't have to retake them again but when you do get booked each time you get booked into jail or prison your prints are retaken because sometimes people become creative and try to manipulate their fingerprints so since these fingerprints were already in the system it was easier for them to identify them and they didn't have to obtain a warrant to get his fingerprints so on december 4th 1993 after Petaluma Police Sergeant Meese had spoken to Richard in jail and encouraged him to contact Meese if there was any hope that Polly was still alive, Richard asked to speak to Meese and told him over the phone that he messed up. Well, he used beautiful language, but ultimately he said, I messed up. He admitted that Polly was dead and agreed to help find her body. That afternoon, Sergeant Meese met with Richard at the Mendocino County Jail, where here he and Sonoma County District Attorney Investigator Mike Griffith and FBI agent Larry Taylor questioned Richard for nearly two hours. Richard claimed he went to Petaluma on the night of October 1st, 1993 to contact his mother. Unable to find her, he went to a park where he drank beer 
and smoked a marijuana cigarette that may have contained PCP, and PCP is another illicit drug. So Richard said he did not have a clear recollection of what he did next. He recalled entering a home through a window and hearing some voices in a room, but he said he had never seen Polly Kloss before that point. He then recalled tying the three girls up in the item, with items in the bedroom. He then recalled driving and suddenly realizing that he had Polly in the front seat of his car when she complained that the bindings were too tight and her hands were going numb. Polly kept saying she wanted to go home. Richard drove around for a while, confused about what to do, and got lost driving, driving up Python Road where his car evidently got stuck on Dana's property. He then untied Polly and placed her on the embankment where she remained while he tried to free his car, at which point the deputies arrived. According to Richard, he waited for about 30 minutes after the deputies escorted him off Python Road before returning to the hillside and retrieving Polly. He then drove to a gas station so Polly could use the bathroom. <coughs> Excuse me. After leaving the gas station, Richard realized he had to kill Polly to avoid returning to prison, so he strangled her with a piece of knotted cloth. Now, when you're on drugs, as supposedly he was with this marijuana that was laced with PCP, he wasn't thinking right, he couldn't, he could barely remember some of the details, but he believed that if he killed Polly, he would avoid prison. So then that's when he decided to strangle her. He later cinched a piece of cord tight around Polly's neck just to make sure, then dragged her to some bushes and covered her body with a piece of plywood and chunks of wood that he found in the area. Richard said he did not think that he had sex with Polly or that he tried to have sex with her. That same evening, uh, Richard, accompanied by Petaluma Police Sergeant Meese, FBI Agent Taylor, Sonoma County District Attorney Investigator Griffith, and other law enfor enforcement officers, retraced his route after Polly's kidnapping. So now they're just going through what happened after Polly left her house and the places that he went. And sometimes there's evidence along the way that they collect and take photographs of, but ultimately it will lead to where Polly was lying dead. So when they arrived at Dutcher Creek Road, located 100 feet from, from Highway 101, just south of Cloverdale, Richard pointed the officers in the direction of Polly's body. Polly's badly decomposed body laid under a piece of plywood and other pieces of wood in an area covered with thorny blackberry briar, thick underbrush, and debris. Her skeletonized skull lay a short distance from the rest of her body, probably as a result, as a result of animal activity. Much of her body had skeletonized, including her entire abdominal cavity with soft tissues and organs all absent, but some portions of her body, including her limbs, had dried in a mummified state. Polly's remains were partially covered by the nightgown Jillian had brought to Polly's slumber party. According to an FBI agent who observed her body, the nightgown was pulled up and inverted under her arms, which was folded across her lap. Her pink blouse was untied and her white miniskirt had been pulled up to her chest, but she was still wearing her bra and panties. Her legs were spread outwards, bent at the knees and hips, which suggested that the body had not been haphazardly thrown into the bush or that rigor mortis had previously set the legs in that position. Strands of Polly's hair located separately from her body and skull had a braided rope and a knotted cloth tangled within them. The examining pathologist, Dr. A. A. J. Chapman, testified that the cause of Polly's death was unascertainable because of the condition of her body, but that the rope and knotted cloth could have fit around Polly's neck and might have been used to strangle her. During the autopsy, when members of the FBI's evidence response team examined the remnants of Polly's panties with an alternative light source, a stained fluorescence indicating the possible presence of semen. Further forensic testing, however, did not detect any semen at the location, 
which meant either that semen was never present or that it was present but had degraded as to it to be unidentifiable. After returning from the Dutcher Creek site on the night of December 4th, Richard again described how he had strangled Polly with a piece of cloth. He added that when he eased up on the cloth, he thought he heard her groan, so he tightened up the cloth again and tied the knot. He then tied a cord around her neck and waited for Polly's movements to stop, which he described as taking forever. On December 6, 1993, Petaluma Police Sergeant Meese and FBI Agent Taylor questioned Richard again and confronted him with evidence that he had sexually assaulted Polly before killing her. Sergeant Meese told Richard that they found semen during an examination of Polly's remains. When Richard asked where the semen was found, Sergeant Meese responded on the body, to which Richard replied, not in her though. Richard denied sexually assaulting Polly. When asked how semen could have wound up in Polly's body, Richard replied, look, I told you at least it wasn't in her. He added, what I'm trying to tell you is that in my mind, at least I didn't try to stick his penis inside her. When pressed again about the semen, Richard responded, that's something that I'm going to have to live with and run through my mind over and over again. Richard also claimed it was a load off his mind and that he was glad when FBI agent Taylor told him that semen was found on Polly, but not necessarily in her because he did, not, he did not want that hanging over him. Richard expressed concern that he would be mistreated in prison if other inmates considered him a child killer and molester. At the end of the interview, Richard said, I have to see what comes out of forensics because hope nothing comes up, hope nothing's in there. FBI Special Agent Chris Allen concluded that the pieces of white cloth had been cut by scissors from a larger piece of nylon cloth, which might have been originally been an article of lingerie or a nightgown, as the pieces of cloth all fit together like, a piece of like pieces of puzzle. So the, there was cloth found in Polly's bedroom, there was pieces of cloth found in Richard's car, as well as the piece that, piece that was found in Polly's hair. So all three of those is essentially what Special Agent Chris Allen said, fit like pieces of a puzzle. So FBI Special Agent Allen believed the cloth could have been cut inside of Richard's car because fibers matching the cloth were found on the car center console and rear passenger floor. Fibers matching the carpet, fibers, in Richard's car were found in Polly's bedroom. Cotton fibers were covered from Richard's sweatshirt found at the Pythian Road site were consistent with fibers from Jillian's nightgown on Polly's bedroom at Cloverdale. Fibers found in Polly's hair were consistent with the carpet fibers in Richard's car, suggesting that her head might have come in contact with the floor of his car. One of Polly's hairs was found intertwined in a knot on the red tights recovered at the Pythian Road site, and it appeared to have been forcibly removed from her head. Two hairs found in Polly's bedroom matched Richard's DNA profile, and they also appeared to have been forcibly removed from his head. Examination of the condom and condom wrapper found at the Pythian Road site did not reveal the presence of any fingerprints or biological evidence. So just a little brief history of Richard's past. Of September 24th, 1976, he had abducted a female at knife point. In December of 1970, 1976, he faked a suicide attempt. So that brought him from the prison or jail that he was at to a medical hospital, and he escaped and engaged in the five-day crime spree. In December 16, 1976, he broke into a Napa home and beat an occupant. On December 20th of 1976, he broke into a home, pointed a gun at an occupant, and told her to drive to Santa Clara. So this was an assault and a kidnapping. On December 21st of 1976, he burglarized a La Honda home in San Mateo County. So his previous convictions, he had second degree burglary from the summer of 1973, May 1974, and December of 1976. 
He received stolen property in December of 1976. And as a parolee, you're not supposed to be hanging out with other criminals and having stolen property is not something you want either. Um, November of 1984, he had a conviction for armed burglary and kidnapping and then an attempted armed robbery in March of 1985. So due to this polyclaw's kidnapping and murder and all of his previous crimes, this gained support for the California Three Strikes Law where if the defendant has prior histories of these violent crimes that can be used against them and essentially lead to longer prison sentences. And at some point it can even lead to life in prison, uh, I believe without parole, but it could be with, with parole. It just depends on the circumstances. So with his, his three burglaries alone, that should have been three strikes, but even with an armed burglary and kidnapping, and attempted armed burglary, he should have been in prison for life long before Polly Kloss was kidnapped. So it gained support for that law. So at his guilt phase, the jury returned a verdict of guilt. Richard turned to the television cameras in the courtroom, made an obscene gesture with both hands by extending his middle fingers up. He then winked his eye and blew a kiss. Um, it was either at the guilt phase or the penalty phase where uh, Richard read a statement and he said something along the lines where Polly said, like, please don't do what my dad does, which was suggesting that her dad molest her. And that's when her dad lunged at Richard, but then obviously got pulled off before anything could happen. So he did read a letter. He did not seem remorseful at all. So at the penalty phase, the ju uh, jury returned a verdict of death and the trial court centered, sentenced Richard to death. So when a trial, so when the jury comes back with death, the trial court can actually either give life without the possibility of parole or can agree with the jury and say death. But if jury comes back with life, then the, then the trial court has to accept what the jury said, and they cannot give him death. So the Supreme Court of California affirmed the judgment in its entirety on June 1st, 2009. So this is more recently compared to some of the other cases that the Supreme Court of California had decided, but they have affirmed the judgment. So where is Richard Allen Davis now? On September 26, 1996, he has been housed in San Quentin for almost 24 years. In 2006, he was found unconscious in his cell following an opioid opio overdose, overdose. And so that's why they do contraband sweeps. They still find ways to get drugs into the cells. But he survived. Um, he's still on death row. However, he was diagnosed with an antisocial personality disorder which they can say kind of is the reason why he went on these crime sprees but at the same time it's not it's just one mitigating circumstance to everything he has done but he still is on death row so that was Richard Allen Davis on how three strikes law in California gained a lot of support it got passed it is used today and if you want to look up California three strikes law you can see all the different crimes that can be added as a strike against you. Even something as burglary and not armed burglary it can be seen as a strike. So give us a like, a follow, a subscribe, whatever platform you're on. We are on Spotify, we're on iTunes, we even post on YouTube. So thank you for listening and hope you join us next time.